well, for me on a personal note, the word pink washing, pink washing just pisses me off. Because- it sickens me. It really sickens me as well, because the same people who talk about pinkwashing never talk about my right as a Yemeni gay man to exist in my country without the Houthi slaughtering me. No, no, no. The same people who use the word words like pinkwashing say that the Houthis are heroes and cheer for them. And to me, it is ridiculous that you cannot see the humanity in the gays that are in these countries like Yemen. Iran, Gaza, the West Bank, there are homosexuals there who want to live, who want to be themselves, but they are an, unable to do it. And we're, they're not speaking up for them. You know, like in most cases, in what I have found, it is mostly the right wing that talks about the gays in these countries, but they don't say it in terms of like, we need to free the gays of Gaza. We need to free these people. These people deserve to live. We have to talk about these issues. What happens is that the the, the gays just get used in, in political agendas without deep care about these people. I, like I told you, like I wish I could go back and live like a healthy gay life in my country, but I cannot. Um, can you tell me a bit about your experience um, moving to Sweden? And I'm, I'm, I believe you were a refugee as well. When the decision came and the ability came and I decided that I'm going to move to Sweden, I remember like I cried so much. I cried so much like growing up in Yemen. I cried almost every single night. I wanted to commit suicide uh, because I wanted to be myself, but I was not able to. And going to Sweden and knowing that I'm going to seek asylum and finally be myself, finally admit it to myself. I never even mouthed the word to myself that I am gay. Because like I, I couldn't, I, I just couldn't do it because there's a death penalty. There's a noose around my neck. So when I was heading towards Sweden, it was the most cathartic experience. Like I remember being on the airplane and crying on the airplane because like it, it just, it felt like I cannot believe that this is true. I cannot believe that I'm finally going to be myself. I cannot be- believe that I might have a boyfriend, that I might hold a man's hand. It was the most insane line of thoughts that I had there. It was just so surreal because I always thought that I'm just going to be married to a woman and live a life of oppression. Now on the way there, I was so happy. And then I ended up in a refugee camp and I I, I thought that moving to Sweden would mean that I left the, that I left the closet, right? That I'm going to be myself, right? I wanted to wear my Britney Spears shirts in pride, you know, you know, I wanted to go to gay clubs and wear, you know, leather and just be like a full on blown out gay. Gay it up. You just went (laughs) gay it up in Sweden. This this, this stereotype or whatever. But then I arrive at the refugee camp and I realized that the refugee camp that I was placed in was not just conservative or traditional like Yemen. It was pretty much ISIS because when, 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 when Charlie Hebdo happened, they were celebrating Oh my when, God. when I was there, you know, I'm not religious. So like I did not during Ramadan, I did not fast, you know, like I want to drink, I want to drink my coffee, you know, don't touch my coffee. Everybody would come up to me and say, you're a Muslim. Why don't you, why are you, why are you not fasting? Do you know that you're going to go to hell for not fasting, that you're going to go to hell for a thousand years, according to this hadith and that hadith. And I'm like, my God, we literally just came to Sweden. And you're telling me that prophet Muhammad said that if you don't fast for a reason, you're going to burn in hell for a thousand years. And I was in the closet in Sweden. And I remember that I was thinking, okay, I'm going to leave the refugee camp. And be myself, right? I'm going to live in Södermalm or there is no like Islamic fanatism. In the refugee camp, like the there was this uh, boy who was like 15 years, 14, 15. And I just knew that he was very feminine. He was very like, I, I just knew that like this guy is probably gay. You know, like there are many kids who are like, okay, th- that guy is probably going to be a queen when they grow up. I remember his family, his dad was one of the people who used to come up to me and say, how dare you, Luai, you're such a shame that you're not fasting. And I kept thinking, oh my God, what if his son is gay and living in Sweden, even though they are in Sweden, even though they are in the most pro-LGBTQ country in the world, the most liberal secular country, his son is still going to be in the same hell that I grew up in. Mm-hmm. And it was true. When I became a journalist in Sweden, I found out that there are hundreds, if not thousands, of LGBTQ 
Arabs in Sweden in hiding, living in fear, living in hate. And I would get mess messages from them telling me, I can't believe that you're out. I can't believe that you're Arabic and you're out. And I tell them we're in Sweden, you know, we're not in Yemen or in Syria, but they tell me like my family would kill me if I, if I come out or if any of that. So I'm, I'm going to continue to live heterosexually. So th this is an issue that is not very popular to talk about in Sweden because Swedes like to pride themselves in having built one of the most liberal and open countries in the world. So if you ever come and tell them, well, actually it's not as perfect as you think it is. Mm -hmm. They freak out because they do not, if there's anything that Swedes hate the most, it's racism. Yeah. And an accusation of racism sends them off the roof. So they do not, they never wanted to talk about Islam or radical Islamism or how bringing in a lot of people from the Middle East has to be met with active attempts and integration process 